this was a shocker today. Stu Rothenberg, a lot of people look at what he writes about the races coming up, said this, while the current Rothenberg political ratings don't show it, I am now expecting a substantial Republican Senate wave in November with a net gain of at least seven seats. But I wouldn't be shocked by a larger gain. With the president looking weaker and the news getting worse, Democratic candidates in difficult and competitive districts are likely to have a truly burdensome albatross around their necks. We're back with the panel. Mara, that raised some eyebrows today. Raised some eyebrows, but you know what? This is the conventional wisdom. It, there is a sense that the math is just too hard for Democrats to overcome this year. And, you know, don't forget, no president has ever hung on to the Senate in a sixth year midterm except for LBJ in the modern era. It is really hard to do. However, when you look at what the Democrats would have to do to hang on, assuming Montana, South Dakota, and West Virginia are already gone, they would have to keep two of the four red state Democratic incumbent seats. Alaska, North Carolina, Louisiana, um, and Arkansas. You look at the polls. Look where, at North Carolina. Yeah, look at any of those polls. North Carolina. The, there's no place where the Democrat is ahead in the polls in those four states. Now, of the four, I think North Carolina is the best chance for Democrats, only because it's the only one where the president actually won there. He won in 2008. He narrowly lost in 2012. We should point out that these are the real clear average of polls, recent polls, and that's essentially tied. I mean, it's plus yeah. or minus three. Yeah. Dana? I think that um, two of the races show some major overreach. Isn't the there's much, there's a lot of overreach by Democrats, but the one in Alaska where the Senate uh, incumbent, Begich, went after the challenger, Dan Sullivan, on uh, a trumped up murder investigation trial. He had to pull it back. He had to apologize for it, but then he's continued to talk about it. That actually has allowed Dan Sullivan to pull ahead in that race. And then in Arkansas, where you have uh, Mark Pryor, again, the incumbent Democrat, going after Tom Cotton, suggesting that he wanted to spread Ebola in America. That is, an, again, overreach. There's other examples of that. And though, I thought there was one surprise in this that people aren't talking about. It's actually in Virginia. I think that Ed Gillespie is the tortoise of that race. Uh, in the poll, for the first time, Warner is below 50, and Ed is up. Ed Gillespie is up with independents, and that was in a plus 10 Democrat poll. And that won't be the same on election day. So there are some sleepers, including Minnesota and Oregon. I think that's why Stu Rothenberg has those stats. Yeah, because all of these folks with the crystal ball and Larry Sabato and um, right. you know, New York Times, they're all looking at the map expanding, not shrinking right. for right. Republicans, fighting battles on a lot of a lot different states. The interesting thing is immigration and how the president's decision plays in to any of these races. Well, that's one of the more radical changes in this election, and it happened as a result of what happened at the border, southern border. Uh, an, an issue that has been assumed since the election of 2012 to be a slam duck for Democrats has now shifted around. The poll shows that if you ask people, are you more or less likely to vote for a candidate who supports a path uh, to citizenship, uh, likely to support the candidate 27 percent, less 36 percent. Now, except for Colorado, where it plays to, to the Democrats, a larger Hispanic population, all of the other endangered or in play states are states where that issue is going to be extremely important and it's going to hurt the Democrats. Now, you add on to that health care, which a lot of us are ignoring because it's you know, sort of a constant, but nothing has really changed in terms of how people are perceiving it, but it's a negative. And then you layer on to that the drag of the presidency, where you've got a sense of the country, there's sort of a malaise, to use an old word which is a sense of a country in decline and withdrawal and retreat and being humiliated abroad, an economy that is sluggish, general incompetence in the government and corruption here and there, and the, the, the polls showing huge numbers saying that the country headed in the wrong d direction. That's a terrible undertow, you know, and that's going to accentuate all the particular issues, immigration especially. Mara, you talk to... Democrats and Republicans, and they, they both will tell you that it's local races in each of these states. Um, yet the president, while he's not on the ballot, really is. If you look at the Washington Post ABC poll, his approval rating is at 42 percent, um, at CNN ORC, 43 percent, and not going up. Uh, he is on the ballot. Of course. The president's approval rating in a midterm election is one of the most important political indicators of how his party is going to fare. Now, of course, these are individual races, and one of the reasons that the Democrats have held on as long as they have, and this thing hasn't broken wide open, is because you have people with names like Begich and Pryor and Landrew running. It is hard to unseat an incumbent, and I think the Republicans have only ever beat two Democratic incumbents, you mm -hmm. know, in something like 50, like years. 50 years. It's hard. 
But these are red, 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 red states. It's a very tough landscape.